If I ask anyone to tell me a story off the top of their head, it's going to be sloppy. And what you'll do is you'll go down this U shape because you take that story and you start to memorize it, which always gets the feedback from people of, Robbie, I don't want to memorize it because then it's going to sound robotic. It's going to sound rehearsed. And they're right. It absolutely does. But you have to memorize it before you can get out of that U shape. So like as you come down the U, it sounds rehearsed, but it starts to sound more polished. And then what happens is there's this moment where you go from memorized to all of a sudden it becomes internalized. And when it becomes internalized, you shoot up the U up to the top right, where it now sounds both natural and polished, which is why the, the best speakers, when we all, all see impromptu, I put that in air quotes, speaking, it's not impromptu. They've told the story dozens, hundreds, thousands of times, which is why it sounds so perfect. My guest today is Robbie Crabtree, founder of Competitive Storytelling. Robbie has helped over 100 founders and product leaders raise $600 million through storytelling. He's also an ex-prosecutor who has overseen 100 criminal cases. We talked about how to systematically craft a great story, how to build your story bank, and how to deliver your story to capture your audience's attention. I've struggled with storytelling myself, and Robbie's tips were incredibly helpful. If you enjoy our conversation, please like and subscribe to support the podcast. How would you summarize what a great story is? I'll give you two because I think it's useful. One is going to be from one of my friends, Jeremy Connell Wade. And I think he nailed it when he said, storytelling is about making people feel something so they will do something. I think that really sums it up nicely. When I talk about storytelling, the way that I like to describe it is storytelling is world building and inviting the audience to collaborate with you. Interesting. Because that, that's pretty different. It's like, because um, most people think of storytelling as just like, telling your story, right? It's not really kind of like a back and forth. So that, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. Well, when I say collaborate with you, it's not that they're necessarily saying anything or, or doing anything. It's that they transport themselves into that world that you're talking about, right? If I'm talking about the world mm. of being a trial lawyer, I'm inviting you to come in and sit in that jury box as I'm describing what I'm talking about in that story. If I'm talking about the future of what I want to build or where I want to go, I'm inviting you to say, is this the world that you want to live in? Is this a world that you want to be a part of? And whatever be a part of means to you, it could in mean invest, it could mean join the team, it could mean support and share the message around. Like that's what I mean by collaborate is when you see that world, you want to be a part of it and further that story in some meaningful way. And uh, I feel like the best storytellers, like you could be speaking to a jury or like a couple hundred people in your audience but they're able to kind of make that personal one-on-one -on -one connection. It feels like you, they're speaking to you, right? <laughs> Do you agree? Or... This gets to the, the whole kind of problem with the word storytelling, actually, in, in my opinion, is it's the wrong term. It really should be story sharing. The way that you have that one-on-one -on -one connection is you open up and you share, and it's, a, it's an act of extreme vulnerability. Because when I share my story, I'm inviting you to feel how I felt, see the world how I see it. And, and I'm trusting that you're not going to judge me harshly. So I always say it, it, sto story sharing is about opening up your brain to show the world how you think, opening up your eyes so that they can see how you see the world, and opening up your heart so they can see how you feel, which is, is really what binds us together. That's why I say it really is story sharing because if you're just storytelling and you're just reciting facts, you're not inviting that other person in, which is where it really becomes story sharing and shines. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, um, you know, we've all been at these dinner parties where someone can just like tell a really great story just like off the cuff. But I think, uh, you know, you have a bunch of writing about how this actually takes a lot of prep work. So <laughs> curious, what, what, what is your approach to building a kind of a great story from scratch? All those great storytellers and speakers are not doing it on the fly. E mm -hmm. Even when they're doing something that is technically on the fly, they've put in so many base reps that they know all the beats to hit. So this really goes back to this idea that I came up with when I was a trial lawyer and what I called, it was my personal framework at the time. Now I call it the competitive storytelling framework because that's my, my company. But it was just this five-part strategy of what's the goal, what's, what's the emotion the audience needs to feel, then what's your hook, what's your theme, what's your dismount? And if we think about that, the first two are strategy. The last three are more tactics. The, yeah, yeah. If you work through that framework, you'll start to build out the, the, the skeleton 
of your of your story. You'll understand what you're trying to make someone feel, and then you're going to build out these pieces that help guide you through that. From there, you can figure out what structure makes the most sense. And then I think you actually have seen my U-shaped graph approach, which is the worst name concept I have, but it's still a very great concept. Mm -hmm. I can go more into that. But you essentially practice it, refine it, go through it enough times where you go on this U-shaped graph kind of journey and get to a level of mastery. So just to kind of, uh, let's start with the five-point framework first, right? So like, just to reiterate, it's uh, define your goal, identify the emotion, create the hook, and then uh, I think it's like focus on a theme and end with a memorable conclusion, right? Yep, um, exactly. Do, do you have a, do you have like a example of that just to kind of bring to life either from your lawyer days or, <laughs> yeah, just like a e example. Mm -hmm. the, the last case I ever tried was a, I actually was on the defense side. In the murder case, the, it was a brother mm -hmm. on brother and the brother did kill his other brother. And it was super tragic and really sad and an and awful case. But I believe that he acted in self-defense. Like I was absolutely sure that he acted in self-defense. So I took on the case and went through it. Now, he admitted to killing his brother. He said some terrible things in the heat of the moment. Like there were lots of bad facts in that case. My job was to go to a jury and convince them to not find this guy guilty, even though he did kill his brother, which is a, not, a, not an easy thing, not an easy thing to do. So my five point framework was, what's my goal? My goal was I needed to make the jury think that just because someone dies doesn't mean someone else should go to prison. That was the goal. Like just to disrupt their traditional way of thinking that if someone dies, someone goes to, to prison. And I had to disrupt that. So that was my only goal. It wasn't to get them to say not guilty. It was just to make them think that there can be instances where just because someone dies doesn't mean that they should go to prison. Now, what did I need the jury to feel in that moment? I needed them to feel like this, my, my client had no other choice and that his life was already ruined from what he had to do in that moment. And he would live with that grief for the rest of his life. And he was already suffering more than anybody else could ever make him. That's the feeling. So then I went into, okay, what's hook, theme, dismount and, and, and all of that. So I actually went back to a source of inspiration that I have. I think the best speaker storytellers, we just have swipe files and inspiration files and all sorts of things that we go back and we pull from. And one of mine is the West Wing. I've used the West Wing in multiple trials at this point, very successfully on, on both sides. And in this case, there's a, an episode where it's called Take the Sabbath. And it's Toby Ziegler is wrestling with the death penalty in, in the first season of the West Wing. And he's talking to his rabbi about what he can do on this and how he feels and all these things. And I remember the rabbi tells Toby, he says, vengeance is not Jewish, is the, the theme of what he's talking about. Now, I'm obviously not going to get up and stand in front of a jury in Texas and say vengeance is not Jewish, but my, my theme ended up being vengeance is not justice. So I did a little bit of a wordplay, and all of a sudden, everything in my closing argument pointed back to this idea, vengeance is not justice. Vengeance is not justice. Then we have to think about, so that's the theme. Then we go to what's the beginning and what's the, the end. So what's the hook and what's the dismount? My hook in this case was coming up and challenging why the prosecutor was doing what they were doing. That this was just like that they actually had no empathy and were not doing justice. I wanted to relay it back into what I was saying inside of my, my, my theme, right? And so I, I knew mm -hmm. that I needed to attack the prosecutor and what was going to come next because they always had the final final word. So my hook was all about why the, the, the jury needed to look at this prosecutor different from what they were about to come up and say because I knew that they were going to yell and scream, bang their fists on the table. So I set it up that way. That was my hook was essentially creating a fight between like a, it's us versus them. And then the dismount was really heavy on the emotional piece, which is you know, and I don't remember the exact words that I said, but the hook was around the idea of this brother and this family have already suffered so much. Nobody would have ever wanted to be in that situation. And you can't judge what you would have done. You can only judge what he did in that situation. And you've seen his remorse. You've seen how he's felt. You've seen the way that he has tried to take care of his family the best way that he can. My ask of you is to remember 
what is the purpose of your role here? And that's how I ended with that big, what is the purpose of your role here? And I led throughout that entire closing argument of vengeance is not justice. So I was trying to tie everything into allowing them to take ownership of this idea that their job was not vengeance, their job was justice. And if I could get them to grab onto that mm-hmm. and not tell them that what they need to do, but just pose that big question as the, the dismount, if I could make them feel that in question and plant a seed just enough, I could win. And ultimately, the jury did come back uh, after about a two-day deliberation, I believe, and came back with a not guilty verdict on murder. And he was able to go home to his family um, and continue living his life, which was uh, you know, a, a pretty, pretty huge victory given what what had gone on and the prosecutors in the case were just shocked wow yeah i mean you definitely changed that man's life no doubt about it yeah um uh and and like going back to going back to uh the the vengeance is not justice like you know like it kind of goes back to what you wrote about which is like a lot of people only remember a couple of things from a story um so so you have this like 10 war storytelling concept like I'm, I'm curious if you actually said the words "vengeance is not justice" during your closing argument, or like <laughs> repeated it many, many times. Yeah. Sometimes the theme is implied. Sometimes it's spoken and it's explicit. In this case, it was explicit and also repeated. Given that, from a rhetoric standpoint, repetition is one of our most powerful tools. So the more that I could latch on to that, and and there's a rhythm. Like a great storyteller speaker thinks about building rhythm into the way that they speak. Because to your point, they might only remember one thing. And if I can make that one thing, that vengeance is not justice, I have a shot. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I'm going to win, but it means I have a chance. And, and that's really what I, I think a lot of people get wrong when it comes to storytelling and speaking. They want to convince. They want to ma- have the other person say, Robbie, you're right. It's more like the movie Inception where you're planting a seed and you're inviting them to take ownership over it and reach that decision themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you want to like um, have them arrive at the answer themselves as opposed to just give them the answer or tell them the answer, right? That's kind of... Exactly. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned like politicians, like um, maybe we can talk a little bit about like, you know, Barack Obama or Donald Trump. It's, it's interesting to think about their slogans and try to think about what kind of emotion they're trying to elicit, you know? Like, like Obama is like, you know, yes, we can. And, and Trump is like, Make America great again, or like build a wall. <laughs> they're, like, they're, they're like they're like different, different emotions, right? Like, maybe, maybe, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Or yeah, I mean, politicians are great at this. They have to be. They have to speak in these like very mm-hmm. short phrases. And actually, the the this like ten word storytelling came from again the West Wing. There's there's a we're in the political debates and talking about like these ten word answers. And I just I just took that. I was like, oh, that's like a brilliant way of thinking about storytelling too. Like the Steve Jobs thousand songs in your pocket, incredible ten like. 10 more storytelling there. It, it's, it's insane. The politicians, so going back to your point, you know, the interesting thing, you, you have Trump's Make America Great Again, which is actually a reference to Ronald Reagan. Like that is a slogan that Reagan had when he was running. Mm. Most people don't realize, again, how much repetition and like pulling from other sources that we're doing. So whereas it's always interesting to me to look out, like people got very upset at that slogan you know, and, and at Trump during that period of time. But like that slogan is is from the 80s and, you know, was from Ronald Reagan and, and by all accounts, you know, was was pretty successful in, in many ways looking at, at kind of U.S. history. But what we can see is there's some slogans that are more kind of do, like doomsday, like there's more fear driven. And then there are some that are more hope. And inspirational driven. So if we think about the difference, right? Uh, you know, build the wall. Build the wall is a is not an inspiring message. Build the wall is like there is a threat that we are trying to prevent from getting to us. So like that is playing into more like the fear. Now, doesn't mean that that's bad because businesses and leaders all the time do it. Like both parties do it. Businesses play into fear of like what you're going to miss out or what you're going to lose. Like it's very classic rhetoric. But we also have the inspiring rhetoric, right? Which is the, you know, yes, we can change that we can believe in. These are, these are positive, inspiring messages. Now, you also have to look at the, the timing of when these slogans come out, why like the country might be more receptive to specific messaging. Uh, that all of this goes into figuring out what those slogans should be, what that 10 word storytelling should be. But I do think most people 
would benefit from practicing 10 word storytelling in, in their, like in their business and what they do and how they see the world and trying to distill these ideas into very simple language that creates emotion at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's go back to the U shape process, right? Like, <laughs> um, uh, you know, when, uh, when I think about creating a story from scratch, either, like I sit on my computer and try to write it out, or maybe like I'm talking to myself in the mirror, both of which are kind of awkward, but, but, I, but I kind of like the U shape process. Cause I think your advice is to just like go outside and like, you know, use the app to transcribe what you're saying. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Instead of getting in our way when we're trying to create a story from scratch, right? And this is what happens. Like we sit down and we write and we're reading it as we write. And it, we hit this moment where we're like, ah, I don't like that. This sucks. Ah, this feels unnatural. And so we delete it. Or we stop. Or we edit. And like you, you, can't, you can't start with a story or a speech or really anything when it comes to communication. If you're going to be starting, stopping, editing in the midst, like it, it's just not a, a good thing. You, like you really do need to just go into flow and get the ideas out. So this is why I like transcribing things and just having someone walk and, and speak or, you know, sit down and just like on your couch and just like speak into to your phone and transcribe it. What it really is doing is we're trying to brain dump or word vomit, whichever term of art you like to use doesn't really matter to me. You're doing that and then you're taking that tra transcription and you're looking at it to figure out, okay, where is the story here? And the way that I like to go about this is I just start highlighting the points that I think are most relevant, that I think are the most useful, the most important, and I just delete everything else. So then now all I have are these highlighted portions, which is generally the core pieces that I need for the story or the speech that I'm creating. Now, I've got to clean it up. I've got to add transitions. I've got to go and, you know, maybe do some research to bring in numbers and data to back up some of the things that I was just speaking out loud. But what happens in that process is you've now word vomited enough so you have all the raw ingredients. You've distilled it down into the core pieces that you need. And then it's just a matter of structuring and rearranging and getting all the pieces together. Once you have that, mm. now we have a story that you can go out there and practice and this takes us to the U-shaped graph. Like once we have the content, we move from this. If I ask anyone to tell me a story off the top of their head, it's going to sound natural because they're, they're just speaking off the top of their head, but it's going to be sloppy. Even, even the most polished speakers, if they don't have any preparation going into the story, it's still sloppy for them. Like if I hear people that I know are really, really articulate, and I ask them to just wing something, it's still going to be sloppy in comparison to what I know they're capable of doing. And that's because they haven't had time to go through the, this U-shaped process. So natural and sloppy is at the top, I guess, left, if I'm looking at it. And what you'll do is you'll go down this U-shape because you take that story and you start to memorize it, which always gets the feedback from people of, Robbie, I don't want to memorize it because then it's going to sound robotic. It's going to sound rehearsed. And they're right. It absolutely does. It sounds rehearsed, but you have to memorize it before you can get out of that U shape. So like as you come down the U, it sounds rehearsed, but it starts to sound more polished. And then what mm -hmm. happens is there's this moment where you go from memorized to all of a sudden it becomes internalized. And when it becomes internalized, you shoot up the U up to the top right, where it now sounds both natural and polished, which is why the, the best speakers, when we all, all see impromptu, I'll put that in air quotes, speaking, it's not impromptu. They've told the story dozens, hundreds, thousands of times, which is why it sounds so perfect. It's just like a comedian, right? A comedian goes out there and tests every little bit of their set. I remember Kevin Hart once was talking about how he goes about this. And he will test it at a small venue and then he'll go to a bigger venue and then he'll go to a bigger venue before he actually goes on national tour. But what stood out to mm -hmm. me most was he wasn't just listening for if people laugh. He was listening to how they laughed. He was listening for a very specific type of laughter at different parts to tell him that he had it ready to go out and deliver it on the big stage. And he would say, like, sometimes I've been, you know, working on a set for a year and then I don't get the feedback that I need. And I start back at the beginning, like just scraps a year of work because it's not polished enough. It's not natural enough. He doesn't have the beats down. Matthew McConaughey talks about this process, too, when he's reading a script and going through figuring out how he wants to embody the character. So the interesting thing is, if you look at this, 
actors, comedians, business leaders, whoever it is, are all going, like the ones who are at the top of their fields. This is not for like the average people. This is for the ones who want to be at the top are all going through mm -hmm. the exact same process in different ways, but all to get to the same end goal. So do you have, uh, when you're going back up the curve, like let, let, let's take the business leader or the founder or the, the tech professional, right? Um, sure. Let's say you're trying to make a speech or like trying to make a pitch. Like, so so sh should, should, I, should we try to actually talk preview of someone else as opposed to just like talk to ourselves? Or what, what's the best way to kind of go from memorized to internalized? Any any person working because I, I, a lot of your audience I know are, are people who will work in tech, right? Work in tech and then also creators. Which like the storytelling skill is critical. If you want to, if you're working inside of tech and you can tell a great story, you have such a huge leg up on everybody else around you, and you can move up into leadership positions and get tons tons more impact and buy in for all the things you're doing. Same for a creator. If you can tell really compelling stories, like you can get other people bought in and, and really build a team that can help you and all sorts of different things. So when I think about this, you should always be testing. Like you cannot do this on your own. That doesn't mean you have to go out and pay anybody. It doesn't mean that you have to do anything like that. I'll, I'll give a, a real example. When I was a trial lawyer, my poor, my poor, poor, poor family and friends, uh, they would hear me give opening statements and closing arguments so many times. And as I went further in my career, you know, they got used to it. And so they, I wouldn't even... At the beginning, I'd be like, hey, can I, can I tell you my opening statement? And they'd be like, yeah, of course. And I did it so many times and they, they would just like run if I would ask them that. So I would find ways to just like somehow like start saying it out of the blue. If I did that, they would, they would listen. And, and the, the reason it was valuable, and, and I'll tie it back to everyone when they're practicing their story and trying to get up the U-shape, different audiences and different people are going to respond differently. The more practice you do, the better you're going to get. I know that that is the most basic advice ever, but the road to mastery of this stuff is paved by 10,000 reps. And the more you do it, the quicker that, that kind of improvement loop becomes where now I might need to only practice a story three, four, five times before it's really polished. Whereas when I started, mm -hmm. I was practicing, you know, opening statements, closing arguments 30, 40, 50 times before I'd ever deliver them. So you just get better because you have all these foundational pieces where it's really easy to figure out the, the beats to hit. Got it. Got it. Um, so along similar lines, um, you mentioned how, you know, everyone who's told a story impromptu actually has a story bank of really good stories. And uh, I know you also kind of coach founders and executives in telling stories. And I think you have uh, something about like where mo most tech people and founders need to have like two or three types of stories in, in their bank, right? <laughs> uh, there's like a sort of kind of past and sort of kind of future. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. So there's two core stories which you're hitting on in terms of kind mm -hmm. of leadership and and that's the the origin story and then the, the vision story so origin story is how you got to where you are what makes you special why you care about what you're doing the origin story creates the ethos of why you're the right person to be doing the thing that you're doing whatever that thing is the pathos is the emotion that they feel behind it right this is you know why you're special why you care that's the emotional piece then when we think about the vision story, the vision story is all talking about the future. Too many people get stuck in telling stories about the here and now, which is fine, but that doesn't inspire people to really act. So the future vision is, you know, what is that big, bold, ambitious future that you see? And this is why I call it world building, because your job is to build that world in such a way that like you essentially went and put in a prompt into, you know, into mid journey and it pops out this image of this is what the world looks like up ahead. Do you want to be involved? Do you believe this is possible? And what we're essentially doing is because we're bridging the past to the future, we're leaving a lot of like this kind of unknown messy middle alone and inviting anyone who listens to it to kind of put those pieces together themselves. Uh, so, so that's why I say they're the two core stories to hit for you know, anyone in tech, any creator, any founder, any business executive, like if you don't have those things nailed, you are not a storyteller in, in, in like today's era. So for the, for the original story, well, at, at least one interview candidates, what I like to like, they come with their resume full of their accomplishments. But what I like to ask them about is like, you know, where, where did you fuck up and where did you learn from it? Right? <laughs> like, so the orange story is kind of like, like you mentioned how it used to be like the hero's journey. There needs to be like some sort of challenge. Yeah. That's part of it, right? 
Well, a lot of times, actually, when, I, when I'm going into um, a, a full origin story, I'll, I'll hit on I, the, the challenge that is actually more meaningful inside of my origin mm-hmm. story is when I was a child abuse prosecutor and I was looking at all the cases that I was trying. And even when I would win a case, the victim's life had still been ruined. It had still been, you know, completely disrupted. And then I would go to work the next day and there'd be 10, 15 brand new cases on my desk that were just as bad. And the, the challenge that came up to me was, am I solving a problem? Am I really doing any good? And looking in the mirror, having that realization of, I get a lot of, you know, people say nice things to me. I get lots of personal validation of, wow, your job is so incredible. You're doing amazing work. But internally, I felt really broken because I wasn't having a big enough impact. I wasn't creating less child abuse cases. I was just saying the person who did this is now going to go to prison and pay for it. So for me, the call to the wild, if you will, from the hero's journey, the challenge is actually overcoming that and figuring out a way to solve. How do I have a bigger impact in the world? How do I play bigger than what I am? And then that normally leads into, you know, building an ed tech company and having no idea what I was doing and being completely lost and like, you know, maxing out credit cards and trying to do all this stuff and being like, I'm going to fail and this is going to be miserable. Uh, And then there's like, you know, some rise and fall throughout there of like the wins and losses and the wins and more losses and all that sort of stuff. So there's this like up, yeah, if you've mm-hmm. ever seen the movie up it, from Pixar, the opening, you know, a couple of minutes is like this rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, which my origin story has as well when I have more time to like kind of like flesh it out and really go deep. Um, because yes, it needs challenges. It needs struggles. It needs things that show you're a human being and you've overcome stuff in your life. Yeah. Those six minutes from up is like, a, like w- w- with the relationship is like a, Master story. I don't actually remember the rest of the movie, but I don't remember those six minutes that started a movie. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and with the vision story, you you um, it's, it's it's interesting that you didn't talk about like, uh, or maybe this is not for your clients, but like if I was a prospective founder coming to you, like you know, you didn't talk about kind of like the the tactics of like, hey, you know, I can help you get more funding, or like I can help you like get more customers. Like, like you actually painted a broader vision than that. Um. Or maybe like if you talk to a founder, you have a different approach. Like, yeah. nope, that's that's the vision that's- story because because if somebody subscribes to that idea to saying I want that world to exist, mm. they can ask that follow up question. Okay, how do we how do we pull that off? That's a how question, but the vision story doesn't need to include the how. The vision story is just showing the what and why it. why it matters. And if we do that right, everything else the 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 people that you want to be pulled into that vision story will find themselves and come to you and say, I, I, that world you talk about, I want to be, I want to be one of those leaders. I want to be one of those people who solves those problems. I want to change the course of where this world is going. Like, I think I'm one of the people you're talking about. How does that actually work? What is needed to to happen to pull that off? And then we can go into all those mm-hmm. dynamics, but that's why I say level one storytelling is just about setting the big vision. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, let's kind of uh, wrap up by talking about story delivery. Like, you know, if I was going to give a big speech or like go present to some execs or something, like um, how, how do I deliver my story in a very memorable way? Like, is there any like tactics that I can use to do that? Memorability in storytelling comes from dynamics in the way you deliver it. Right. So everyone knows what monotone is, but there's lots of mono things. You can be mono paced, mono volume, all sorts of different things. There are are plenty of studies out there to show this. The most memorable speeches are the ones that have the biggest changes between them. So that rise and fall, the shifts between tone, the shifts between speed and pacing and all of this. And, And I call that at its core musicality. When you're speaking, when you're delivering, you want it to be musical. Now, this does not mean that everybody should sound the same, right? Just like there are very different types of music, there's very different types of speaking. Steve Jobs does not present the same way as MLK does. Oprah does not present the the same way that Sarah Blakely does. They are all wildly different in their ways, but they are compelling because all of them understand the way to use their voice as an instrument, which is one of the key things to remember. So when we're speaking, we want to also create melody so that it's easier to remember. This is, you know, take some practice and take some dynamics. But the easiest way to to fix these types of things is record yourself and play it back and see, 
Am I changing my tone? Am I changing my pacing? Am I changing my volume? Am I doing things with my body? Like if I'm sitting just very close and I start, Peter, it's great to meet you today. I'm really excited to talk to you. We're going to have a great discussion about storytelling and how important it is. And this is what we're going to do because we have to really break down three different parts of storytelling in order to like you, you, first off, you would be like, Robbie, we got to end this. We got to end this. It's not going to work. And, and if you publish it, you would be like, what is wrong with this person? Whereas then like when I come out of it here, you can see me, you know, I'm changing tone and facial expressions and using my hands and body language. And I can, you know, speed up if I want to talk really fast. And for certain things, you hit it really slow to show it matters. And we can do all these things over time and you can practice them and see yourself come to life. But uh, that's what I say about creating a compelling story, figure out where your dynamics lack. And then the other thing is watch speakers who you appreciate and who you admire and see why you admire and appreciate those speakers and how you can take things from them and replicate it. When I was a trial lawyer, one of the things I did is I just watched a ton of my colleagues try cases. And I just picked up on the things that I liked. And I would try things and see if they worked for me. Some of my like favorite trial lawyers, I could do nothing like they did because they had a very different way that they carried themselves, but I still would try to learn from that. In fact, I would always think that the best trial lawyer was the one who yelled and screamed really loud. That's how I thought when I started. And I tried that early on in my career and it was very unsuccessful for me. I'll never forget. I watched one of the, the child abuse prosecutors in, in, in my job deliver a closing argument. And all she did was like whisper and she was super soft to them. And I mean, the jury just absolutely fell in love with her. And I go, wow, that's a really interesting approach. So I actually became much more soft when I was speaking to a jury because it, it worked better for me. So what you do is you you find these sources of inspiration, and then you see how can you replicate what they do in a way that's still authentic to you, but elevates the way that you speak. Got it. Got it. I, I, I love that. You have to be, yeah, I, I really uh, love the point about being authentic to yourself. And also, what I found is that if you are if you're talking about something that you're actually really believing that you authentically care about, then you can tell a story much better most of the time, right? Because <laughs> you actually really care about whatever you're saying. So, do you have uh, just the last question? Do you have any kind of like um, cl closing words of advice for aspiring storytellers, people maybe who, you know, I actually have a I actually had a stutter uh, early in my career too, or like you know when I was younger, uh, or people just who just like have low confidence that they. They kind of have labeled themselves that they're not good at storytelling or they're not good at speaking. Like, like, uh, do you have any, uh, you know, motivational advice for them or <laughs> any closing words of wisdom? Storytelling is a skill to be built. It's not something you're born with. And if you tell yourself that you're not a great storyteller, I can guarantee that's going to be the reality that you live. You can practice it. You can learn it. It's there are a lot of things that you can do to significantly improve your storytelling and your speaking ability very quickly. It does not take years and years and years. Now, mastery, yes, mastery is going to take you years and years and years. Like you have to obsess and love it like I do in order to get to those, those levels. Most people don't need to get to mastery level, right? Most people need to get to good. Some people need to get to great. And then there's a small handful of people who need to go beyond that because of what they're trying to achieve in the world. Getting to good is something that Almost anybody can do if they're willing to do a little bit of work, watching some people, understanding some basic structures, practicing, doing a little bit of game tape review. And within you know six months, you can be significantly better, even if you're doing this all on your own. If you're doing it with someone, like you can improve as a storyteller in one to two months pretty significantly. And mm -hmm. I just encourage people to... Think back to, especially because we're talking about tech and creators. Steve Jobs was not was not great at storytelling when he first got, you know, when he got fired from Apple the first time. Like that was not what made him great. He learned a ton when he went and you know built Pixar and spent time around all these people. And when he came back to Apple, he really elevated the storytelling that he had. He, now, part of this is he worked with really talented people like Aaron Sorkin, who, you know, wrote The West Wing and also wrote The Social Network and these different things to help him on speeches and to, to see things. So he was willing to, you know, spend time to get the help. But he improved at a level that he's seen as one of the greatest storytellers that we have. On the flip side, I want like my favorite storyteller is Anthony Bourdain. And why I love Anthony Bourdain is because his storytelling is just raw. 
He was self-taught. No one gave him anything. He just figured it out because he was willing to practice and experiment and write and tell people and see what resonated. So if you're out there and you think, I'm not a great storyteller, the best way to become a great storyteller is to start telling stories. And then remember that it's not just about telling stories. It's about sharing stories. It's about opening up, being vulnerable and authentic in the way that you deliver those to people so that they can see the world that you see. That's where connection really starts to take off. And you'll see those gains to the point that you want to just keep getting better and better because all of a sudden people are going to like you more. They're going to trust you more. They're going to promote you. They're going to give you money. They're going to want to support you. They're going to want to be your friends. Like it opens up so many things for life. And then it just becomes really fun. And you're like, I got to get really great at this. So once, once you start, it's very hard to stop, which is the good thing. It's just about getting started. Got it. Yeah. It's the same thing as any skill in life, right? You just have to get over yourself. You got to put in the work and like maybe be cringe for a little, a little bit and, <laughs> and you'll quickly improve. Yeah. Um, for sure. And, and uh, Robbie, like if people want to help, uh, where can they find you online? Find me, you know, my, my website is competitive storytelling.co. My LinkedIn, you can search my name, Robbie Crabtree. You can also follow me on Twitter at Robbie Crab. Those are probably the best places to find me. And then I'm also also wor- working working on getting my book out there, which, you know, you, you've got to, to see the, the manuscript. So uh, that'll be out hopefully in six-ish months is kind of the timeline that I'm working with my publisher right now to get that out. So in the, you know, by the end of the year, there will be a book also around all this stuff. Awesome. All right, Robbie. Thanks so much.